So last time what we were looking at is writing code that executed SQL statements where we take control of the code and we write stuff as opposed to just dragging and dropping and configuring. Uh, we mentioned that sometimes the default behavior of the controls do exactly what we want it to do. In which case, we're happy because then they do pretty much exactly what we want it to do. But other times, we might have slightly different needs. And we might need to take what was done, take the default behavior, and maybe custom code something our own way. So in this example last time, we did a simple login where we used the objects that we've used before, but we didn't just drag and drop and configure them. We actually wrote our own code to create the objects and to set the properties and do the SQL query. So let's revisit that and then we'll go on from there. login page as being the initial page. Okay. So let's watch how it behaves. Then we will um, go and actually look at the code and see how we accomplished it. So the login page has text box and a password control. My password and user ID is Mike and password. So if I have logged in successfully, it will tell me that I successfully logged in. If I didn't log in successfully, if either the user ID or the password is wrong, right now it just gives me a message saying unsuccessful. So if any of those are wrong. Whoops. Gives me an error in that case. Probably because I left the password blank. We'll work on that also. Because it looks like there's a problem when we left the password blank. So we type in something that's invalid for user ID and password, we hear that it's unsuccessful. We type the user ID correct and the password incorrect, we hear it's unsuccessful. Finally, we type in the password correct as well, and we get the successful logon. Now, a couple things to keep in mind. You may not want to tell them what part is wrong if they've unsuccessfully logged in, right? You may not want to tell them, hey, your user ID is wrong or your password is wrong. Just from the viewpoint that, you know, that's uh, a potential security issue. If it's not right, it's not right. You don't need to tell them in more detail. Certainly, you'd have, like, links that says if you forgot your user ID if you, or if you forgot your password. But what I'm saying is my generic message saying unsuccessful login is probably okay. I don't need to worry about giving a different login message if the user ID is wrong or a different message if the password is wrong. Okay, so let's look at the code that did this. It is in the log 
login page and it's on the button click event of the page. How do we get to that? We just double clicked the button and that will take us to the default script for that control. Now the default script for a button is what? The click event because that's what you normally do with buttons is you click on them. I have my label that has the word label in it to start. I'm going to change that to say nothing initially. So I'm going to get rid of the default text. All right, so you double click on that. It will go and it will add the method. If it's not there, if the method is there, it will take you there. Now one thing I want to show all right, is if you look at the code for this, when you double click and create that event, it actually adds a on click method to the button that says button one click. Which you have to be careful about if you decided you didn't want code there, right? Because when you double click it, it creates a method called button click in the ASPXCS file. Now if you decide later, oh wait a minute, I don't want to do something if you click on the button, and you remove that code, the button still has a pointer to say on click call this method. So let me go and break this and show you what I mean. Let's say I accidentally double clicked on that button. Oh, it created this method. Let me go and delete that method because we'll pretend I didn't want a method here. So I get rid of it. If I try to run it now, I get an error because my login page is still expecting there to be a method called on click button one click. So just note that when you double click and create an event, it doesn't just create it in the ASPXCS file, it also puts a pointer to it, it also re refers to it in the ASPX file. So let me go and put everything back to where it should be. All right. And we should be okay now as we are. All right, so let's look what we do in here. And in a rare moment, this must be your lucky day, if you are inclined to play in the lottery, maybe pick today's date and go play it in the lottery. But I've completely commented this code. All right, normally I don't. Normally I don't simply because a lot of times when I write the code, um, I am talking as I'm writing and I don't want to sit here and spend a lot of time typing because that's boring and so on. And in addition, a lot of times the code that I write is a good exercise for you to go in and comment it because that allows you to demonstrate that you understand it. All right. So it's, a, it's almost a way of taking notes or studying what the code does. But this one I did for you. So this one, we're going to do all the things that we did when we just dragged and dropped, except we're going to write the program statements to do them. Because if you remember, what do we do when we create a SQL data source? We drag the SQL data source on the page, so we create that object. We click configure. What's the first thing we do? We set the connection string, so we pick the connection string. What's the second thing we do? We create the select statement, so we define the select statement. What's the third thing we do? If there's any parameters, we say where the parameters come from. Like if there's a question mark uh, in the query, all right? We supply where the parameters are coming from, and then we're done. And then when the page opens, it automatically runs it, and in our case, it binds it to a SQL data grid. That is, in all the examples we did like this prior to this example, that's the formula we used. We created the SQL data source, selected the, uh, selected the connection string, defined the SQL statement, defined where the parameters come from, and then we go and we tie it to the visual control. 
In this case, we're doing the same thing, but we're writing code to do it. So, the first line is creating the SQL data source. SQL data source OBJDS equals new SQL data source. That sort of standard syntax for creating an object. Class name, object name equals new class name. You could supply parameters if you want, or sometimes the constructor doesn't require parameters. So if there's parameters required, you put them in. If not, you call it without any parameters. Now, the next thing you did, if you remember, when we dragged over that connection string, is we selected, I'm sorry, when we dragged over the data sources, we selected the query string, or the, the connection string. That's exactly what we're doing now. Except again, we're doing it through code. And there's actually two parts to the connection string, a provider name and the connection string itself. And this is a syntax that allows us to get it. Essentially, all this says is that it's coming from the web config file. So system configuration configuration manager says, hey, we're pulling this stuff from the connect uh, from the uh, <coughs> config file. Connection strings says, well, it's coming from this section. <coughs> Excuse me. This section of the config file. This says this is a particular connection string we are interested in. So this is the name of the connection string we are interested in. And then finally there's two pieces of it. The connection string and the provider name. And we need both of them. So we set the SQL data source's provider name to the provider name for this connection string in the connection string section of the web config file. And we do the same thing for the connection string. This is one of those things where I like to like show you like how it came from so it doesn't look like someone just like typed in just some random junk and boom it works. All right, there's logic to it. This part of the code effectively is saying, go and pull that data from the web config file. These are the objects that allow us to access the web config file. This is the name of the section that it appears in in the web config file, the connection string section. This is the specific name of the connection string. And then this is the part of the connection string we want, the provider name. So in the web config file, under connection strings, under this specific connection string, we're going to pull this connection string and provider name and set our objects connection string and provider name to that. Okay? Good news is, is like I've heard people joke about gravity. Even if you don't understand it, it still works. All right? So what you have to just remember to do, if none of what I said made any sense about how that works, is put in the name of your connection string here, and it'll work. All right? Ideally, I want you to understand it. And maybe you don't understand it today, but maybe in a week you'll understand it. But... If you just copy that code and put in your connection string, that will work. All right. The next thing is the select command. Our data source dot select command equals, and we put in our select statement. Select star from user table where username equals question mark and password equals question mark. Okay, so that's our select statement. This is what we'd type in if we were doing it through the visual control. Remember our strategy here. We're going to tell if it's a legal login by trying to pull up data from the user table 
where the user ID, or the user name rather, matches what the user has typed in and the password matches the password. So we're going to take these two parameters, we're going to take these two things on our page, the username and the password, and we're going to plug it into this SQL statement that says select star from user table where username equals some parameter and password equals some parameter. And then we're going to do a query. All right. How many rows will that query return? There's two choices. How many rows will that query return? What's one of the choices? Pardon me? One or zero. All right. If it returns zero, it means it's not a valid password. It means that there's no one whose user ID and password matches what the user typed in. So you typed in just some characters that didn't correspond to any username or password. <coughs> the SQL statement would return zero rows. If we typed in the correct, a, a correct user ID and password, then the SQL statement will match one row. So that's the only two choices. It's going to match nothing or it's going to match one. Can't have a case of it matching two. Why not? Because we define the username as unique. So for whatever value of username we type in, at most there can be one user with that username. Right? When we created that table, we said that there's a unique index on username. All right? Which means that um, what do I want to say? Lose my train of thought. Which means that um, because there's a unique index on it, there can't be any more than one that has that value. So here's where we define the, the SQL statement. And we put parameters in for what's going to get, get filled in at runtime, right? We don't know who's logging in. But we're going to take whatever they type in and put their username there and put their password there. And that's what this is doing. I'm adding a parameter called username and I'm getting that value from the text box name, text box username. Here I'm getting the password from the text box named text box password. And that will fill in these values here and here. All right. For however many question marks I'm going to have, I'm going to have a line like this. In this case, we want a username and password, so we're going to have two parameters. We have to give each of those value, each of those parameters a value. And more than likely, in the case of a login, you're pulling those values from the text boxes on the screen. I would say up to this point, it's fairly straightforward. This next part gets a little tricky. All right, the next part is just a teeny bit tricky. Because now we actually want to do the query. We want to execute the query. And so our next couple of statements are going to get us ready to execute the query, and then they're going to execute the query. And then the next statement after that is going to look at the results. All right? So. This specifies what we're going to do with the data. All right? There's a mode for this data source. And that simply means how we're going to deal with the data. We have two options, if I'm not mistaken. Let's Google it. Two choices. Data reader 
or data set. What's the difference between the two? Well, without going in too much detail, the data reader is used When the data source mode is set to data reader, data is retrieved by an iData reader object, which is a read-only, forward-only cursor. The data set mode allows you to do more, in short. You can read forward and backward and sideways. Well, I don't know what sideways means, but you can, read it, you can read it different ways, and you can access it different ways. The i, uh, the data reader property, simply means, hey, we're going to read through the data once. Got to start at the beginning, read to the end. Now, in this case, starting at the beginning and reading through the end is really easy, right? Because at most, we're going to have one row. So there's not a lot we need to do with this data. We essentially just need to check to see if something was read, right? If something was pulled in by that SQL query. So we don't have to do a lot of complex operations. So the simpler mode of data reader is acceptable. So, I'm going to set the mode to data reader. This actually is what runs the SQL statement and gives us the results. And the result is an object of type I data reader. All right. So we run our statement that says go and do the select. This nulls out the arguments after we're done reading it, which doesn't really matter in this case. But this performs a select and gives us the results in this variable called my data which is of type iDataReader. So what's an iDataReader look like? Well, there's not a really good description here. So let me draw it on the board. We'll draw you a picture of what the results, what my data looks like. So if I do, if I create a, a SQL statement, let's talk about our SQL statement. Our SQL statement was select star from user, user table. Let's just say this is a SQL statement. I'll add the where clause in later. All right? What are the columns in the, in the uh, table? Let me look those up.
user table has user table ID username password and full name and I have two rows in that table. I have one mic password Mike Zellers. I have two dog ABC123 Doug Huber. Those are the two rows. But I could have obviously a bunch of rows. If I execute this statement, what it's going to give me, the iData reader looks like this. It's going to contain, it's going to be like a table that contains as many rows as the rows that the query returns and as many columns as I have specified. So, in this case, it's going to look like this. The first column is column sub zero, but it also has a name user table ID. So I can refer to it either way. I can refer to it by the column number. I think I can also refer to it by the name. Okay? Second column is column one, username. Third column is password. And it's column two. Fourth column is full name. And it's column three. So the iData reader contains a table that has the results of our query that looks like this. So it looks like the table, in other words, in this case. Now, if it was a more complicated query that filtered stuff out or joined tables together or whatever, then it still looked like this, but it might have stuff from two different tables and so on. So the data reader contains this data. How do we get at that data? We can point to one row at a time. All right? We can look at one row at a time and we can read from start to end. All right? So how do I point to a row in the data reader? I say, give me the next row. All right? Give me the next row. So the statement that you'll see in my code is my data dot next. All right. First time I execute that, what row do you think I'm pointing at? First time I execute it, I'm going to point at this row. Because before I've done any reads of this, I'm sort of pointed at the very beginning, sort of before anything. So if I execute the next command, the first time I do it, I'm going to get the first row. If I execute it again, I'm going to get the second row. So I can point to one row at a time. I can say, give me the next row. First time I say, give me the next row, it gives me my first gives me my third row. Fourth time gives me the fourth row. All right. How do I know when I'm done? How do I know when there's no more data left, right? Because in this case, there's two rows. So if I said next, next, if I did next a third time, there isn't a third row. So it's not going to find anything. That's in this case. There's only two rows that are going to be returned. 
I could have another table. I could change this table so there's 50 users in here. And I could do next, 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 next. All the way till I hit the 50th row, then I would be done. So how do I know when I'm all done? Any thoughts? Yeah. When you eventually hit an end of stream uh, okay. reception. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now, I'm going to be told when I hit the end of the end of the the data set. And how? What's the mechanism for this? It's the return value from this function. This is either going to return a true or a false. If I return a false, that means there's no more rows. If I return a true, it means there is a row. A row got pointed to. So, again, let's carry this through. If I had a loop, I do my read and populate this iData reader. I do my first next. That points to the first row and returns a value of true. I do my second next. That points to this row and returns a value true. I do a third next. It returns a value of false. There's no more data. All right? So that's how you can tell how many you have. By looping through and doing a next and seeing if there's anything there or not. So let's say I've pointed to something. Let's say I've read, I was at the beginning and I do a next and I'm pointing to that. How do I refer to an element in that row? Well, I either give it the position or the name. So if I were to say my data zero, that will give me the value of the zero column for whatever row is currently on. So if I did one read next, I did one next, and I'm pointing at this row, if I asked for the value of my data zero, it would give me that value. If I asked for my data three, it would give me that value. If I asked for my data four, it'd give me an error, because there's not a fourth column. All right? I can also, I believe, specify it by the name of the field. Like that. Pretty sure you can do that, too. So let's summarize this. When we Execute a query, and this is only a select query, right? A select query can return more than one row, all right? So when we execute a select query, we get back a table that's like this. It will have as many rows in it as our rows selected. It will have as many columns in it as we've asked for. Now, in this case, I've asked for all the columns, so it's going to give me those four columns. I wouldn't have to ask for all columns. I could only ask for two columns, for example. All right, and then I only get the two. All right, I can read through this by issuing the command my data next. If it returns a true, it means that there was another row to get. All right, if it returns a false, it means it's hit the end of the line and there's no more data left. So, read next, read next, read next, read next. When it gets false, I'm all done with the data. The first time I execute the read next command, it points at the first row in the table. So I have to do the read next one time to get the first row of the, uh, of the table, the result table that I did the query on. Now, a lot of times we do want to loop through all of them. This time, we don't. We don't need to write a loop. Why? Because we know for a fact that this statement, this isn't our actual statement, right? Our actual statement is where username equals question mark and password equals question mark. 
So we know by definition that this is only going to return at most one row. It's going to return zero rows or one row. If we've returned zero rows, that means that the first time we executed this MyDataNext didn't find anything. If the first time you execute MyDataNext, it returns false, means that no data was returned. All right? In which case, you know that it wasn't a legal logon. If it returns something, we don't even really need to check what it returned, right? It got the right one because we use the username and password as part of the SQL statement. So let's look at the code. With this in mind, keeping this in mind, let's look at the code and make sure we understand how this works. Set the login to the start page again. Okay. So we do all this. We set our we create our data source, we define the connection string, we set up our SQL command, we add our parameters, we say, hey, we are accessing this in data reader mode. We execute our SQL command and get an iData reader, which is exactly what I was explaining up there. My data is a data reader. So how do we tell if there's anything in the data set? Well, we asked for the next one, and this is where my syntax was wrong. I had the word next up there. I should have had the word read. So where I said next, the actual command is read, not next. Sorry about that. I grab the next element from the data source by doing a read command. That's going to return either a true or a false. What does a true mean? A true means that, that it found something. Right? There was something in the results that came back from the query. Therefore, the user entered in correct credentials so we can log them in. A false for that read statement simply means that there was no data returned, which means that the login was not successful. And that's exactly what we do. If the data returns a true, my data returns a true when I try to read it, that means that it returns something. If it returns a false, it means it didn't find anything. And I set the text screen, uh, the, the label to either successful or unsuccessful, depending on what happened. All right? Does that make sense? Questions about this? Again, the key to this is understanding that this is going to give me back, essentially, uh, a two-dimensional array, an array of arrays. All right? It's going to give me back rows and columns, a table. All right? And there will be as many rows in the table as rows that the SQL statement returned. There will be as many columns as the columns I asked for. Uh, if, then, I go and... 
Um, as for the first row, which is what this does, and it returns a true, it means it found something. And again, going back to when we described this SQL statement, if data is returned, that means it's a successful login. Because this SQL statement will either return zero rows or one row. So if it returns any row, if we read it, if when we read it, we find that there's a row, it was successful. Otherwise, it was unsuccessful. And we know it's an unsuccessful login. Now, normally, after you log in on one page, you don't want to have to log in. You want to remember that you're logged in so that when you go to page to page, it knows who you are. All right? So that's what we're going to talk about now. Is everyone clear, or at least pretty clear, on the login mechanism? All right. The next thing we're going to talk about now is each page knowing who it is that got log who who it is that logged in. All right. Because imagine if you went to Canvas, you logged in, you see your list of courses. You click on the first course, you had to log in again. You clicked on the first assignment on the first course, you had to log in again to submit it, and so on. Wouldn't be very good if every time you tried to do something on Canvas, you had to log in on every page. Instead, you log in and it remembers that you're logged in until you're no longer logged in. How do you log out of Canvas? two ways. There's two ways. What are they? You could clear your history and that would automatically log you out or you could click on your little icon and choose log out. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm not sure the first one actually would log you out. You wouldn't, it you seems would, like it has. You would not be able to log back in but I think you'd actually be logged in even though you've cleared your history. I could test that if I really wanted to, but... I was just thinking on experience. Yeah, no, that's... I mean, definitely if I log out, it's not going to remember who I am the next time I come. All right? But I'm not 100% sure clearing your history by itself would log you out. In a nutshell, there's two things you can... You're, you're right in that there's two things you can do. You definitely can click on the icon to say log out. The other thing you can do is after a period of time, you're automatically logged out. All right? So, for example, if you went and you fired up Canvas and you started reading something, then you went on a vacation to Hawaii and came back after seven or eight days, would you still be logged in? No. It would automatically log you out. The web server needs a way to keep track of stuff about a particular browser session. One of the things it needs to remember is who's logged in. Because you don't want to log in, have to log in every page. You want to log in and stay logged in until you log out or until a certain time has passed. Okay? Now, how long a time do you think Canvas should wait? before it automatically logs you out. Half hour. Half hour? Does anyone have a different answer? I think the 20 minutes that they keep flashing is too short. Okay, time. so they do say after 20 minutes they'll log you out? Yeah, and I keep clicking and I'm okay. I'm like, okay. yeah, I'll get back to it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, like what if you had like a math test? I mean, there's math problems that could take you 20 minutes anyhow. Half hour? It's, it's like for inactivity. Like right. Not right. Well, again, like let's say you had a test and they gave you a complicated math problem, you know, and you were trying to figure out what it was and you were going through and, you know, thinking and all that. And there's no activity at all, you know, until because you're trying to figure out the answer to the problem. I think 45 is safe. Okay. It's a double-edged sword because what if I gave, what if they gave you eight hours? What would the problem with that? 
they gave you eight hours of inactivity before they logged you off. You log in publicly somewhere? Yeah. You logged in publicly and forgot to log off, you're vulnerable for 20 minutes, or, or, or how long did I say? Eight hours. All right, so there would be potential security issues if it, if it takes too long to automatically log you off. There's actually, <coughs> there's actually another issue with it keeping you logged in for that period of time. Besides the fact that you're vulnerable, <coughs> there's, a, there's a, a problem from the web server's perspective. That's eight hours that the web server has to keep track of the fact that you're logged in or that it thinks you're logged in because you haven't done anything. Interestingly enough, if you don't click log off, the web server isn't entirely sure when you've logged off, right? So if, for example, you go and you close your, um, go and close your browser window and go home, or you leave it up and go to lunch, all it knows is whether there's been activity or not. It doesn't know if maybe you've, you've gone to ESPN.com because you're sick of schoolwork and you want to see what do the Browns play this weekend. Doesn't know any of that stuff. So therefore, that's why it's based on inactivity. So, if it gave you eight hours of, of inactivity, you could log in, check your email, go to YouTube, and spend the next eight hours watching Vines from 2015 or whatever. All right? And the web server would have no idea that you left them. All it knows is it's not getting anything from you. But, ah, we set the time out for eight hours. Therefore, it's going to wait eight hours of non-activity for it to finally say, okay, this person must be done. I can no longer worry about them and forget about their session. Now, the reverse of the problem as well, right, is if, let's say, it only gave you ten minutes. Well, there's definitely some things that you might be doing on Canvas that might take you 10 minutes to figure out what you're going to do. In which case, there's no activity for 10 minutes. Like, again, like if you had a quiz, you have a math problem. All right? So, the administrators of a site like Canvas have to decide what the best amount of time for inactivity is. Too long, and it's a security risk for the user, and it's a burden on the server, for the server's perspective. Too short, and you have people logging off when they just went to get a cup of coffee or something. And that's not good either. Okay, so that's what a browser session is. A browser session will last typically until you have timed out. In other words, you've gone a certain period of time without any activity, or you've explicitly clicked the logout button. So, we want to remember who you are until you've logged out or clicked, until you've logged out or timed out. The way that we remember who you are is with what is called a session variable. All right? And here is. some session variables I created where we can remember the things that we want to remember. So, I'm going to not be lazy and do a star here. And I'm going to say user table ID username and full name. Now, I'm going to set the session, I'm going to create a session variable. How do you create a session variable? You say session, and then within quotes, you give a name to that. So I'm going to create a session variable for the three things that I pull from the database. User table ID, username, and full name.
remember, how do we refer to the things in the My Data data set? Well, remember, we're always looking at one row in the data set. So we've done one read, so we're looking at the first row. I can ask for the zeroth column, and that will be the user table ID. And I can do that for the other two variables. So this is username, and that is my data one. And according to this, I can give it a number, or I can give it a name, just as was said. And in this case, I want element two, which is the full name. How did I get this? Well, my SQL statement says, select username, user table ID, username, full name. That's element zero, one, and two. Zero, one, and two. So now I've created these three variables that are called session variables. And they will have these values until my program changes them, all right, or the user logs out, or the user times out. So every page from here on in is going to have access to these variables. So I can tell if someone's logged in or not. All right? Or I could do things like display their name. So that data is available now if I want to, to pull up that person's user record. All right. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go. I'm going to make sure this still runs because I made a couple changes to it. And I'm liable to, make, liable to have made a typo or whatever. <clears throat> All right, I'm successful. to stay on the login page, right? I want to go somewhere else. So I'm going to redirect the user to the default page. So if I've logged in successfully, I'm just going to send them to the login or to the to the home page. Alright? Now on that home page I'm going to go and alter it so that it displays in a label the username. The user's full name which is in a session variable called session full name. In fact, I'm going to put that on the master page, right? Why not? Because when you go to Canvas, I'm pretty sure it tells you who you are on every single page you visit. So that would be a good thing to include on every single page the person visits. So I'm going to go here. I'm going to put a label. Here. Actually, I'm going to put two labels here. First one is going to say welcome. And the second one is going to be their name. So, I have to write code to fill in that label with the value of the session variable. Now, I'm going to sort of do it, all right? In other words, I'm going to do it, but it's not going to work. At least it's not going to work all the time, all right? And then we'll go back and fix it. So, I'm going to go in here in the page load event, and I'm going to say label to dot text 
equals session full name. So I'm going to go and run this. And it didn't work. I was thinking I'd get this a second time through, but I got it the first time through. It didn't work, why not? Because before I've logged on, there's no value for that variable, and therefore I can't use it. So what I have to do is, I have to put a little if statement in here that says if Alternatively, I could say welcome guest. I guess that would work too. Okay, so I go and run this. says welcome guest. Why? Because I haven't logged in yet. Because I haven't logged in, the session variable is not populated. Alright? Because it's not populated, it displays, it is null, and therefore it displays the welcome guest message. I go in and put in my username and password. If I can type. I get, I successfully logged in and it tells me welcome Mike Zellers. So I go to faculty search, welcome Mike Zellers, faculty list, faculty search. faculty department. Welcome Mike Zellers. So after I've logged on, every page remembers that I'm Mike Zellers. Let's make a logout page. Master page, sure. I'm going to put a button on this. And I 
have to like terminate the session. All right. So I'm going to say session dot expire. I thought I would say session expire. Session clear. Notice that, by the way, our IntelliSense, there's a value for session timeout. I can set the timeout for how long you have to timeout, which means a canvas, if it was clever, could give you a short timeout when you've logged on. If you've gone into a test, it could increase your timeout then to answer the question. Uh, that I posed before, what would be a good timeout. Maybe 20 minutes is an okay timeout if you've just logged in and you're not doing anything. But maybe if you're in a certain section of Canvas and you're doing a test or whatever, well then set the timeout longer to give you time to think or whatever. So, whoops. I think this should work. And when I'm done, by the way, I want to redirect. So I do response dot redirect, and I'll take them back to the home page. Again, I'm going to send to the URL of login. And the logout, I'm going to send to the logout. set default then as the home page. So I go here. You can click on login. Login. Welcome Mike Zellers. Log out. Click the log out. Welcome guest. We can be even smarter than this if we want. Why should it show log in and log out all the time? If you're not logged in, what's the point of showing the log out button? If you are logged in, what's the point of showing the log in button also? So I can make those enabled or disabled 
depending on whether they're logged in or not. So, I can have code in my master page that says, if I'm logged in, I want the log out button visible. And I want the logged in button not visible. If they aren't logged in, then I just want the opposite. So login button is there. I can click on it. Log in. Now the log out button is, is there for me to log out. All right. This is how we can use the session variables to remember whether you're logged in or not as you go from page to page to page. Faculty list two. Facult list two. Okay, now it should work. Any questions about what we've done so far? Now, where's the next step that this is going to go? The next step is, and think about it, think about how to accomplish it. This will be um, one of our challenge questions for next time. All right, we'll start with the class. What if I didn't want a certain page access to if you weren't logged in? How could you do that? I create a page that, let's say, allowed me to change something in the database. I just don't want any guests to change something. I only want people to change it. All right, that are legitimately logged in. So that'll be one thing that will that will um, that will will put in here that you have to be logged on to do certain activities. How do we code that? We already have like much of the answer decided, right? It's just a matter of arranging some of the code we already know. After that, we'll work on how we add things to database tables. So far, we've only done queries. We need to do how to we need to know how to do inserts, updates, and deletes. So we will cover that uh, pretty soon as well. Questions? All right, we'll see you in lab. I'll go unlock the lab, then I'll be back here to gather my stuff, and then I'll be back in lab.